All right, very good. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for including me on the program and also thank my discussant for allowing me to bait and switch my paper uh, in the last few days. Um, so uh, thanks, Matt, for being flexible. So uh, this paper is a paper about um, service quality. And it was really m started out as a marketplace paper. That was my motivation. But actually, over the last year, I have figured out that this is actually um, an AI paper. And in, I've gone so far that I teach this paper, some version of it, in all of my AI executive education classes and so on. Um, and so I guess I, want, I, I hope that you like the paper for what we originally wrote it for. But actually, my prediction would be that some of the issues I'm going to raise here will be big themes in future versions of this conference as the things that, the, the, really, the phenomenon that it foreshadows becomes a big real world scenario. Um, and so this is joint work with Camilo Castillo, who's on the job market from Stanford, so everybody look out for him, and Bharat Chander, who was formerly at Uber and is now a first year PhD student at Stanford. Um, so what, what is the phenomenon that I want you to think about relative to the AI conference? Um, AI, does, it's a general purpose technology, as we've discussed before. Um, there is a subset of a general purpose technology that this paper is an example of. And that subset is basically um, providing quality assurance and measurement of workers at scale. So if we think about the general purpose technology of looking at videos, images, telematics, and matching them up with training data, and then creating a score for every event, that is, the general, that is the subset of the general purpose technology I want you to focus on. So in particular, um, we see that everybody's leaving a digital footprint generally. And of course, you know, the big tech firms are, are absorbing that and doing stuff with it behind the scenes. And China is doing that as a government you know, in front of you. But what, a place that actually this can be controlled is in the workforce. So if you imagine um, cameras on an assembly line can watch every single thing that the workers do. Of course, we, we've always had cameras there for a variety of reasons, for thefts and things like that. But now with, with simple off-the-shelf AI and you know, about a week of people coding those for did you violate safety protocols or not, and maybe a little bit more work to match up with assembly line productivity and error rates, you can basically give a score to every, everything that people do and then see both what is good for productivity. You can train people. You can see who's doing safety violations and improve your productivity. So that is happening already in manufacturing. Um, it is not talked about a lot yet. Um, and it's, it's going, my forecast is that that's going to happen sort of at scale across the economy. I think every bank teller, every DMV worker, um, basically, you can have a score on every interaction. So that's the phenomenon to think about. And I want you to have in mind as you go through the, the paper. Um, so this particular paper is about equilibrium quality in, um, in marketplaces. And so there the motivation is that um, market design, it, 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 marketplaces are really changing industry structure in a variety of ways. So they're making it easier for service providers to enter. Um, they're allowing people to come in and basically start a small business. There's either a business of one or a very small business with very little experience and track record and be able to flexibly move in and out of that um, and thus often expand output. Of course, transportation, we've seen this huge expansion of output. Um, and so in that setting, we might worry, though, that there's like an expansion of output, there's a reduction of cost, but maybe there's a reduction of quality, too. And of course, when you read the newspaper, you, know, you see the terrible experience somebody had in an Airbnb, or you know, occasionally somebody gets robbed or worse by their Uber driver, and so on. And so the narrative that we hear in the press kind of reinforces this view that there's a quality reduction. Um, but in fact, we've also seen a lot of innovations that come along with this. This isn't lost on marketplaces, right? They understand they have to provide high quality to, to succeed and grow. And so a lot of innovations have come along in terms like things, and we, we focused a lot on reviews. There's been a lot of research on the impact of reviews. What this paper is going to be about is a different method 
of ensuring quality, which is actually just directly measuring what goes on. It's not front and center to us in the foreground, but eBay is measuring how long it takes for you to actually take from the order and ship. You know, there's lots and lots of, of quality measuring that's going on on the back end. And so if you're working with these companies, you actually realize really one of the main focuses or the most important effort in R&D and marketplaces is to use measurement to improve quality and incentivize um, service providers to provide high quality. Now, in other research, I've looked at how these, this can hurt things in news. But in ride sharing, I'm going to argue that it helps. So in particular, in the case of, of ride sharing, um, there's been an explosion of research using um, internal data from these platforms that in particular shows that workers value flexibility. Um, and so if we think of the big, of course, there's, you know, We've talked about the, the problems that this creates for old taxi drivers and so on. But on the positive side is that there's a huge amount of worker surplus from being able to come and go from the, from the labor force. And other peop a bunch of papers have documented that. And so then the question would be, in this setting then, if the main benefit is that people can come and go from this work, you know, I guess David Otter made a comment about that earlier today, how, how beneficial that was, um, it, does that come at the expense of quality? So what we're going to look at is, is the case of Uber. I actually approached Uber to write this paper a couple of years ago because I saw what was happening in the AI and the telematics. And I said, oh my goodness, here is a very rare example where there, there's a very clearly defined product. Like an Airbnb and a hotel are not the same thing. But transportation, you're getting A to B. That's about as close as it gets from the old economy to the new economy. And once I discovered telematics, I can actually measure directly using the same technology the quality of both products. So this seemed like, like the, per, the best example I could come up with of, of measuring this quality effect. Of course, I'd love to hear if somebody has a better example, but that's what I um, came up with. And so they agreed to give us the data to do this project. Um, I'm not going to measure crime here. That's really not a big deal in the United States. And actually, generally, Uber is better for crime in developing countries because of corruption and things like that. Um, I'm going to focus only on the, the telematics component of safety. So we're going to use the case study of Chicago, where the Uber app is used to dispatch both taxis and Ubers. Um, it's not used to dispatch every taxi ride, but it's used to dispatch some taxi rides. I look at this um, region in Chicago. And then what we do is try to compare UberX rides and Uber taxi rides. Just some basic background information. Um, the Uber and taxi fixed fee per and per mile charge are equally equal proportions, but the taxis are roughly twice as expensive, just to um, compare that. Then what else is different? UberX has a whole bunch of quality information as well as nudges. So the UberX driver is going to see the average of your last 500 rides in terms of the rating as well as the score on the last ride. So they're going to get feedback about how well people liked their service. Um, there's also rating-based incentives. And in the time period we're studying, there is safety monitoring and warnings, but no explicit incentives based on the telematics. The telematics were just getting rolled in, and they were they're experimental. So that's purely informational. Low ratings and complaints are relatively uncommon, but poor driving is, is up there. Slow driving is also a, a common complaint. And that's a forecast of one of the empirical challenges we have in the paper, which is that actually people's preferences are not just for safety. They have very strong preferences for getting places efficiently. And so to try to actually interpret these metrics in terms of what people want um, is challenging, and so we're going to have an approach to deal with that. Um, just to give you some some evidence, this is a this is what you you can rate an Uber taxi ride, but the the ratings probabilities are lower. And also, you might think that people don't really think the same way about rating their taxi driver to the Uber driver. So we're going to take those problems and say, we are actually not going to look at ratings of Uber taxis. We're not going to use that data at all beyond this picture. And instead, we're going to use the telematics. Um, so here's a little bit about the way the, the incentives work. Um, if you go below a 4.6, you know you get a notification. 4.5, another notification, temporarily de deactivated at 4.4. You can take a course, get back on. If you don't improve, you get kicked off. Um, a, an important when I started writing this paper, I wanted to sort of it, the beautiful economics paper, the simple economics paper, would be the one that would say, ah. All these incentives are what make Uber drivers do well. What we're going to show is that the incentives are play a potential role, but they're probably not everything that's going on here. Um, just to get a sense of why I, I would say that, if you look at all the trips that we see in our data set, we're going to work with 7.6 million trips. 
um, the, most of the people are nowhere near at risk of being deactivated. So their um, ratings are above 4.6, so they're, they're many notifications away from being deactivated. We do a little exercise where we try to show if you got in uh, three-star ratings in a row, what fraction of drivers would then be at risk of passing various thresholds. And for the 4.4 threshold, even if the driver got 23-star ratings in a row, there's still only you know, a sink, like about 1% one, one to 2% drivers at risk of being deactivated. So generally, most drivers' behavior is not directly impacted by deactivation. Um, okay, so what are these telematics? So here are the telematics we look at. Um, mounted, with the phone mounted, was the phone being handled? Were there hard brakes? Were there hard accelerations? And then two speed metrics. The speed metrics are determined every block you ride through in your UberX ride is rated as a percentile of other cars that drove through that same block. So this was a 90th percentile trip through this block, or this was a 10th percentile trip through this block in terms of speed. Every block you go through gives a percentile. So your trip might result in 100 blocks, 100 percentile measures. So that's a lot of data. We use various machine learning methods to select which ones seem to be most predictive. And we focus on the 10th percentile and the 80th percentile of those percentile metrics. So it's a little bit of a mouthful. It's a percentile of a percentile. Basically, if those are intermediate, it says that you are usually in the middle of the distribution. If those two measures are extreme, it's saying sometimes you're slow and sometimes you're fast. And so it's going to turn out that people like you to be more intermediate than you are. The drivers are generally more extreme than people like. Um, this table just shows how much of those metrics are determined by driver effects, rider effects, and trip characteristics, and how much is residual. And you see that drivers affect a lot of these metrics. Um, the riders have very low effect on, the, on these metrics in terms of just explaining variation, except for ratings. Riders have a, there's a big rider fixed effect on ratings. And so this is another reason not to use ratings as, as your outcome measure. Just from if you're the efficient use of information, those ratings are actually exposing the drivers to a lot of, of uncontrollable noise. And they would also, if you use it as an outcome in an experiment, it also subjects your experiment to uncontrollable noise for imbalance of, of, of riders and so on. So actually, it's better, just from a purely statistical perspective, in terms of understanding the quality of the ride, to look at the telematics than it is to look at the ratings. In addition, the non-rating event is very systematic. So people tend to um, rate, be more likely to rate if it's a bad ride. OK, so what we do instead is we construct scores. And this is something that um, Hito and I have been working on theoretically. Um, both of us encountered that in the tech firms that we worked with. That, um, actually, it's a, a, a practice that we have both in introduced to many firms is the practice of creating what we call a surrogate index. And so a surrogate index is basically a projection of some metric you care about on a bunch of intermediate metrics. And it turns out that that makes for much more efficient experimentation in tech firms. And so we're going to use that same technique here. We have a paper about that um, with Raj Chetty and uh, Hyun Sung Kang. Um, and so essentially, the method is to project the ratings onto the safety metrics, but we're going to also include trip effects and dri driver effects so that we can think about what's the impact of a change in safety metrics on your, um, on your star rating. And then we will use that constructed in index as an outcome measure. And it turns out that's more econometrically efficient under some conditions. So this is just, I won't have time to really interpret all of this, but these are just some pictures that show the, the, the two by two heat maps of the projection of the star ratings onto the telemetry. Whoa, there is a thing there. All right, so let me actually skip this and jump to some results. So the, the first empirical exercise we do is that we compare UberX rides to Uber taxi rides. And so the kind of theoretical experiment you're imagining is you're standing on a corner about to take a trip. Um, what would be the difference in the ride that you experience if you got into an Uber taxi or an UberX? Now, it turns out we're going to have millions and millions of UberX rides and only a few hundred thousand Uber taxi rides dispatched by Uber. So what we're going to do is take the Uber taxi rides as sort of the set we're interested in and look at the, the difference between the tel telemetry on those rides and the most comparable 
UberX rides. And so we use actually, a, I thought that when we first read this paper, I thought this was going to be a really interesting econometrics paper about different methods for causal inference. It turns out they all give the same answer, so that wasn't interesting, um, but it was good for the empirical results. Um, so the, the, the simple thing, the easiest to understand is the matching estimator where I take for every Uber taxi ride the nearest um, UberX ride. We divide the whole time and space into about 260,000 cells um, by time and space that are sort of equally balanced. And so you basically the same origin location, destination location, and hour of the week are, are in the same cell. And that's the, the, distance metric, the distance metric is based on those things. So we get the same answer whether we use fixed effects or the matching technique. And we basically show that the UberX rides are better than the Uber taxi rides by between you know, 0.1 and 0.22 standard deviations. Um, and, and they're very, um, they're precisely estimated differences. They're not, so they're not hugely better. So UberX isn't a lot better than taxis, but you can very solidly reject that the taxis are better. Um, so then the question becomes, why is this and what's driving it? Um, so we break this apart in a couple of different ways. First of all, we want to look to see how, to, how are, are these people responding to the, the user preferences. So when I, my informal survey of dozens of Uber drivers that I talked to, I said, you know, when do people try to rush you a lot? And they all said, the worst is morning rush hour. Um, and so here we look at, we break things out into the morning rush hour, the afternoon rush hour, and off peak and look at how the effects differ. And what we find is that the, the differences between UberX and Uber Taxi are greater outside of rush hour. And so we interpret that as that you're, they're more responsive to the rider preferences. And in the paper, we actually show that the riders prefer, using the star ratings, that the riders prefer faster driving and rougher driving during rush hour, so which is consistent with my informal survey of Uber drivers. Um, so, so, that's a, so, the, so, the, so that is sort of consistent with them responding to preferences. Um, we then try to look at what else is driving this. So we try to look at um, the response to rider preferences. And so we basically regress the scores on the, what the rider has tended to want in other rides. So we use these leave out estimators where we take the, the riders, um, what the rider's metrics have been in other rides, and we see that the, there's a, a positive responsiveness that, that the driver seems to be responding to what the passenger wants. Um, we then look at their Im the impact of nudges, and we look at what's the impact of the last rating that the driver got on the rating of their next ride. Of course, there's serial correlation, so what we do is instrument for the last rating you got by the ratings that other drivers got in that same hour of the year. So if there was a rainstorm or a traffic jam or something else that made everybody grumpy, so the other riders in that exact same hour got bad ratings, that's the instrument for the rating that you got on your last trip. Um, and so we also instrument with the average rating by the rider on other trips. And what we basically find is that the lower was your last rating, the higher is your next rating. But in terms of the safety, we get very precisely estimated very small numbers. So basically, if you got rated poorly before, maybe you offer people a mint or an iPhone charger or a glass of water, you say, please give me a five star, but you don't really adjust your driving. And that may be partly an accurate realization that the best way to get a better rating is by being nice or doing other things rather than you know, having fewer hard brakes and accelerations. That might, that, that the elasticity may be higher with respect to these other characteristics. Um, then we look at what happens when you get notifications, and we basically find that whether or not you're told you, you're doing badly or you're told you've just improved, in both cases, your ratings go up. So that suggests that it's more of the informational intervention than the incentive thing going on. Just Uber talking to you and saying something to you tends to make people pay more attention. Um, OK, then the last thing we do is we run a randomized experiment. Um, well, actually, I mean, this experiment was run in the, in the um, course of business. Um, and we analyzed this large-scale experiment. And this experiment was bringing this telemetry to be more useful for the drivers. And so in particular, um, they, they, you got this notification that said, hey, learn about your driving. This will be automatically generated. And this is just for you. It's not going to affect anything else. It's just for information. And then they get this dashboard, and if they do too many hard brakes and hard accelerations, they get an exclamation point. So 
actually, I don't, where's John Kolstad? So this brings me back to John Kolstad's PhD thesis, which kind of showed that if you told doctors they were worse than average, they changed their behavior even if it didn't affect anything else. And here's going to be, we're going to basically see the same thing here, that everybody thinks they're above average. They actually find out they're below average. That's news to them, and they adjust. So um, what w th this is the experiment. This experiment was, was run more broadly, but we're focusing in on Chicago, where we had done a lot of cleaning of the data. And we're going to look at this. Now, it's a little bit underpowered for Chicago, because th this experiment is at the driver level, not the trip level. So we have millions of trips, but not that many drivers. Um, so what we do is we then look at the impact of being exposed to the app. So you're exposed, your treatment is your app has changed. So we, and we can see what's the effect of that on your behavior. And so we find um, modest and marginally significant effects overall in terms of this nudge on your behavior. Um, we then look at how often you interact with the app, and we basically use the experimental assignment as an instrument for whether you actually looked at the app in the last week. And we find um, stronger effects there. Um, but when we, what, when we tried to really dig into this, we then looked at the, the intuition that we had, which was that really what this app is telling you, for if you're an average driver, this app is just telling you you do fine. So we really shouldn't expect it to have that much of an effect. So then we zeroed in on the pretreatment quality of the drivers, and we interacted their pretreatment quality with the treatment um, of the information. And then we find for the bottom 10th percentile, the stronger and statistically significant effects of being exposed to the information. So pulling all that together, like what do I think this means for AI and sort of labor markets and gig economies, first of all, it says we shouldn't be relying so much on star ratings, which already the firms are moving away from that. Second, that telemetry can be a really powerful way to understand quality. Um, third, that giving drivers information about that in various ways actually seems to change their behavior. So maybe we can have this beautiful thing of like improving worker safety broadly and worker quality broadly without sort of having to be firing people or playing them piece rates or whatever else. It might be that, that lighter touch informational interventions could get you a fair bit of the way. Um, from a, why do I think this will be interesting in future versions of this conference? Well, you can just imagine all of the policy issues, the privacy issues, the surveillance, all of the other concerns that you might have in, in putting this type of technology into place, making it fair, making it non-discriminatory. So I think there's going to be a whole research agenda about how this gets used in the most beneficial way that protects um, workers um, while getting the benefits of the technology. Great. So I will stop. Thank you.